Well, good morning and welcome to TriStar Digging. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, today's video is going to be a little di different than uh, the normal video that I do. Normally it involves work and detailed information about the job that I'm doing. Uh, but today is rain, well it's been rainy all week. And so I'm kind of knocked out of working today. Uh, this week I did get to haul a few loads of rock. And, uh, but today we're going to be talking about how to, uh, well, not necessarily how you would, but how, because everybody's got a little different way of doing it, uh, how I bid jobs or price jobs. Today we're going to Red Bank, Tennessee, which is about an hour and 10 minutes away from my house. And that's one of the very first things that I do when I'm looking at a job or trying to bid a job or give a price on a job is, is find out where it is. <clears throat> In this situation, uh, when the lady called me for the job, she gave me her address and I found that it was a little over an hour away from my house. I generally try to uh, keep my jobs within 45 minutes of the, where I keep my equipment primarily. Just because the amount of time and travel it takes to get equipment to jobs and the expense nowadays of doing that. You know, I saw yesterday a gas station where diesel was $3.99 a gallon. So, that's the first thing I consider when I'm looking at a job is how far away it is. So in this situation, it's more than 45 minutes away, so I add a little bit for travel time, and I discuss that with my customers and people call me, is I don't sneak any kind of charges in or sneak any kind of uh, extra money in. I'm upfront and honest with the people that call me. So I charge a little, more, bit, a little bit more, and she was understanding of that knowing that it was going to take me a little bit uh, longer to get there and get home and to get materials there and back. So logistics is another thing to consider. Uh, first will be how far away it is and second is logistics. So I'm doing this job which is going to be cutting in a new driveway to her house and um, putting in rock and we're going to also put in some geotextile fabric underneath the rock which is going to keep grass from going up through the rock and to keep the rock from being mashed down into the uh, to the ground. So the geo fabric, for what it cost, is a good investment, but not a lot of people want to spend that extra money uh, to make that extra step, and that's fine too. So the job we're going to look at today is in an area that I don't work in, uh, haven't been in this area working. I've got some challenges there in that I've got to find place to get rock I've got to find a place to dump the material which will be some topsoil and uh, some debris I think she's added uh, some work to it like removing the sidewalk so I got to find a place to dump this concrete material for the sidewalk and I got to find a place to dump the topsoil that I'm going to be scratching off to build the driveway those things you've got to take into consideration too I'll have to spend a little bit of time on the computer trying to figure out where the closest rock quarry is. And then it's going to be even a harder challenge to find somewhere to dump that debris and topsoil. I may end up having to truck that all the way back to my dump site that I have here uh, where a guy's wanting to build up an area. It's a low area building it up with dirt and concrete and such. So logistics, that's another thing to consider when you're bidding a job or pricing a job. You know, if I can't find a place down there to dump that, it's going to be extra time and extra money for the customer because I have to bring it so far uh, away from that job site. And then another thing, another thing you want to look at and consider is, and this one is crucial, this is important. Talk to the customer, the person calling you, about what they want to see the end product to be. Some people doing this particular kind of job would just want you to bring a truckload of rock and put it on top of the grass and make them a little place to park their car or, or just drive in, which is fine if that's what they want. Then the only investment they have is, is spreading that rock. In this situation, talking to the customer, she wants a good quality driveway and a good quality area to park her car. So in order to do that, uh, we talk through the process of removing the, the uh, any topsoil, any vegetation, 
that's on the uh, in the area where we want to build the driveway in the parking area. <clears throat> that stuff's got to go. It just causes problems. And then the next step was whether or not she wanted to put fabric down. So I explained the process of putting the fabric down, which keeps grass from going back up through the rock, and it also keeps the rock from being mashed down in the ground. So talk to your customers. I talk to my customers to see what it is they want. I don't want to over build any particular job for them, but I don't want to under, under um, build it either, if that's a word. I, you know, if, if a customer wants to save some money by um, not doing something to the extent that it needs to be done, then I'll explain the consequences, really. Well, no, maybe not the consequences, but the probability uh, that there will be of some kind of issues down the road if you're trying to just save a little bit of extra money. Sometimes saving a little extra money costs you more money in the end. So I don't, I don't uh, upsell, so to say, my customers and try to talk them into doing something that they don't have the budget for or they don't really want to do. I give options and then, and then help them make a, a decision based on their budget and based on the, uh, the, the, the opportunity that we have to do that job. Like I said, that's crucial. Find out what your customer wants. I want to find out what my customer wants to give them the best job that I can um, for what they're wanting to do. I have turned down very few jobs, but I have turned down some jobs where somebody wanted me to do a particular uh, job or, or some work, and I knew it was gonna fail. I mean, they, they either didn't have the budget for the work to be done, or they didn't want to spend the money, and that's, that's their prerogative. You know, it's not for me to say how much or how little somebody spends on a job. But in very few situations, I just basically said, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to, to look at the job, but I don't think it's something I'd be able to do because I knew it was going to fail. And if I do that job or if you do that job, if you're a, a small contractor, you're trying to get into work, if we do those jobs, that we know are going to fail, then the customer is going to be mad at me because it failed. And your name is on that so that when somebody looks at that job and they say, well, what happened there? Who did that job? And they, the, you know, the customer says, well, Sammy did that job. And so you got to protect your business too, but you also got to make sure that the customer is pleased with the work you're doing. Those are a few factors to consider when you're looking at jobs. Other things are, like going down here today is gonna to cost me you know, a little bit of money, travel time. Uh, I'm not able to work today because it's wet, so that's not really, time's not really a big deal. But the cost of getting there and the cost of getting home, uh, take that into consideration too. I've already given uh, an estimate on this job based on some pictures that the customer sent me and also based on the description of the work that uh, she wanted to have done. But I'm going today for a couple reasons. One is to make sure that I can get my equipment to the job site. That'll determine what size trailer I take and if I can get both pieces of equipment down there at the same time or if I have to come back and get another piece of equipment and actually what equipment that I need to take. So I'm gonna go down there today and I'm gonna mark the road for a 811 call before you dig so they can do a utility uh, check, make sure there's no utilities in the area where I'm gonna be doing the digging. And then looking to see the road condition to see if I can get that Ram, 30, Ram 5500 with that uh, Diamond C trailer carrying both pieces of equipment. Or if I need to bring the dump truck and the uh, panel hitch trailer and get both pieces of equipment on it. So that's probably what I'll have to do because I'm gonna have to haul material away and haul in rock in there. Half a mile, right turn onto Old Copper Road. Thanks. So the, so the dump trucks, but that, that's why you go. And then uh, make sure that the, utilities, the utility area gets marked and check for that. And also checking for, for obstacles in your way. You know, if there's anything that's going to take you more time or more effort to get the job done other than just the conversation on the phone. 
Next right. Sometimes there are jobs where someone would call you and they just need to get a general idea, a ballpark price of what it would cost to do a particular job. Proceed on the current road. Thank you. To get a general idea or a basic idea of what it would cost to do a job because they're looking at buying a piece of property. That's another question that I ask when I'm looking at, uh, at jobs. We're talking to people on the phone about jobs is whether or not they own the property yet or it's just it's a prospective piece of property that they're looking to buy because just to be honest with you i've spent in the past before i kind of figured out how to do this i figured out a solution for it i spent a lot of time uh, going to look at jobs where property hadn't been bought yet and i understand completely that you know a customer wants to get an idea of what it's going to cost to build a road or to build a pad or to clear the land and get the trees out of the way. I completely understand the customer won't know that information. But me as an as a small business, it's just me. Six miles. I don't have an estimator going out and looking at jobs all day long doing estimate estimate estimations. So it consumes a lot of time going on those jobs. So if you know up front if the property's already been bought or the if they're just looking to buy the property then that helps you out when you go to uh, give a person a price if they haven't bought the property yet I'll, I'll ask for pictures um, you know I'll ask for a description of what they want to accomplish and then give them a basic idea a general idea of what it will cost to build that road or put that culvert in or clear the land and, and I tell them up front, this is a general basic idea. And then once, and if, and if that works within the budget of being able to buy the property, then once the property's bought, I'd come out and give a more detailed estimate on the property. And the customers understand that. People that call you will understand that if you're explaining it to them. If you just leave it like, well, I'm not coming out, I'll just give you a price, I'm not, I don't have time to do that. That would leave a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, that's, that's not really a way to handle that call. Other situations where the property's already been bought, then if, they're, if, the, if the customer is, you know, pretty close to making a decision on that kind of work, then you need to go out and look at it and, uh, and give them an idea of what it's going to cost to, uh, to bid that job. Now then, there... I, you know, I don't know if there's an industry standard for pricing or bidding jobs. Maybe in commercial settings there are, but a small business like myself, uh, I generally do jobs time plus material. I have bid a few jobs or priced a few jobs um, to do the whole job and just have a firm price up front. Mostly because that's what the customer absolutely wanted. There's another thing to ask the customer, or if you are a customer, if you're if you're calling a contractor, be upfront with what you're wanting to get the work you're wanting to get done, and what you're expecting as far as cost and price. Some people that I've talked to want an absolute bottom dollar. This Four is a set price. Some people will Stop say, uh, "Well, I'll do time plus materials, and just give me a general idea of what you think it's going to cost." Time plus materials is basically just what it says. How much time it's going to take me to do the job and what the materials are going to cost to do the job. The day we're living in today, materials have gone through the roof. Uh, culverts, you know, for driveways, drainage situations have gone way high. And, you know, rock has gone up, uh, dirt's gone up, diesel, insurance repairs maintenance everything is going up so we have to reflect that as a business owner we have to reflect that in our prices or we won't stay in business uh, cost of doing business has gone up chasing a rabbit here back to pricing or bidding jobs i generally like to do time plus materials rather than bidding a price for the for the whole job typically when you're 
giving a set price for the whole job. Um, and this works for the for the small business owner. It also works for the customer to understand this. When you're getting a price for the whole job, we as business owners have to consider uh, what it's going to cost to do that job and typically add some to it to make sure that we cover ourselves in case we run into an obstacle. That's just being honest. And that's why generally I like to do time plus materials. When I come look at your job or if I'm talking to you on the phone, you're going to know that I charge a thousand dollars a day plus materials or I'm going to charge twelve hundred dollars a day plus materials or maybe fifteen hundred dollars a day plus materials. And, and the reason it would go from 1,000 to 1,200 to 1,500, and there's some variables, there's some, um, um, there's some things that influence that. And the reason you're gonna know that up front, is, and then I'll estimate, you know, it's gonna take me a day and a half, or it's gonna take me two days, or it'll take me three days to get the job done. And what would influence two the daily rate? Ahead. on the route. <laughs> Stop and go traffic. What influences the daily rate between 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 is how far away the job is, how difficult the job is to get to, and what size equipment am I bringing? Am I bringing just the skid steer? Am I bringing the skid steer and the Mini X? Am I bringing the skid steer and the, uh, the Cat 308, which is a mid-size excavator, which has to be hauled on two different trailers? Or am I bringing the Dozer and the Mini X or the packer so there's really a lot of things that go into why I charge different prices for daily rates and so that's why I'm going today I think this job that I'm looking at is going to require the skid steer and the, the mini X to do this job but I'll know that when I get there another thing to consider is your minimum and as a customer or a small business owner taking into consideration that minimum rate of charge to do a job. My minimum is $500 if it takes me uh, an hour to do the job or it takes four hours to do the job. So I charge that $500 minimum because if I don't, if I go out and do a job that takes me an hour to do and I only charge $100, $125 or $150 to do that, I haven't taken into consideration the amount of time that it get, takes to get ready to go do the job, get to the job, unload equipment, do the job, load the equipment back, and get back home and unload the equipment again. So there's a lot more involved to doing the job than there is actually doing the work of the job. But now there's, and see I'm in a little different situation because I've got a lot of different equipment that would keep me busy on bigger jobs. And, and, and sometimes when the jobs are really small, I'll refer those to some other guys that are doing this kind of work because they may only have a tractor. They may only have a skid steer. And it fits right in their wheelhouse of what they like to do. They go do a 30 minute or an hour job and they get it done, they go to the next one, they do that. They may do three or four of those jobs a day. That suits their business model well. But for me, it doesn't because I could be running the dozer and the big excavator uh, for $150 an hour for, you know, $1,200 a day. In half of a mile, keep right onto Tennessee 60 North. So the minimums are important to know as a customer and as a, a business owner that, you know, those minimums have to be there. And just because my minimum is $500, that doesn't mean that somebody else is might be 250 and uh, that's why you know in the best interest of my customers sometimes I will refer them to somebody else where the job would be a little cheaper um, I want to talk a, a, a little bit about um, doing a good job and being doing a job professionally and making it look neat and clean being on time and Keep showing up when you say you're going to show up and do what you say you're going to do because 
doing that, you build a customer base. I've got customers now. Um, Proceed about. Four I guess I've been full time to, excavation uh, work now. South. I guess I've been full time excavation now for about uh, three years, going on three and a half long. years, I suppose. And so now I've got a customer base that when they got a new project or a new job to do, they'll call me and, and I'll put them on the schedule. Proceed on US 64 bypass west. Proceed on the current road. One half of a mile ahead on the route. <laughs> Slow traffic. So when a, uh, a customer calls me that I've that I've done a lot of work for in the past or just some work for in the past, you know, they know how I work. I put it on the schedule and I would just work down my schedule. And that's another thing too about being honest about when you think you can be there. There are some contractors, whether it's excavation or carpentry or concrete or uh, digging a ditch. There are some people that say, I'll be there in two weeks. I've had that happen to me so many times as a customer myself that I that just I don't like that. And so I'm not that way with people that call me. Uh, the way that I do that, and obviously I get busier in the spring, summer, and fall, but I have a schedule and I go by it. So if you call me for a job and I'll tell you your tenth on the schedule, your tenth on the schedule. So I work down my list knocking those jobs out as I go through them. There are exceptions to that when it might be an emergency. Somebody's cut their water line and they uh, they don't have water or the, the storm has washed their culvert out to their house and they can't get into their house. Those jobs obviously get bumped up uh, because they're kind of an emergency situation. But other than that, I go down my list and knock jobs out as I come to them. And as a customer, you understand you understand that and appreciate that. And as a business owner, you're being honest and you're being fair with your customers. You're not jumping people ahead of uh, of them and doing work that you're when you're supposed to be at this other person's property. That's just the way I do it. And if you're if you're truthful and you're honest and you do a good job you won't be without work there's a lot of work that's to be done and if you are a good business person and you treat people right you will have work so that's just basically a, a, a snapshot of the way that I bid and, and price jobs and like I said, there's a lot of different ways to do things and a lot of different way, ways to, uh, to make your business model work as a small excavator. And that's where I am. Uh, I want to, maybe, I, maybe I'll talk just a minute about getting into the excavation business and if you should do it or what are the, what's the thought process behind excavation work. <laughs> First of all, I'll say, if you have no experience uh, with excavation work, you haven't had experience running a tractor or, or skid steer or whatever the case, don't go out and spend $70,000 on a skid steer and then start spending two, three, four, six, eight, ten thousand $10,000 on attachments and you don't have any experience at all. That's a disaster. Um, if you do have some some experience running equipment and you have a basic idea and understanding of uh, of what it takes to run a piece of equipment and and to learn the work then then yeah by all means I I'd say do it uh, but you have to have a foundation to build on if you're going to start your own excavation business so one thing you might do if you have no experience or very little experience is to get a job with a, a larger excavation company and work for them and be willing to do here's the here's the 13 miles ahead on the route stop and go traffic here's what's important about that take a job with a larger excavation company if you have a goal or an ambition to start your own excavation company get a job with another excavation company 
and be willing to do anything they have. Uh, whether that's digging the ditch or putting rock around a culvert or um, running a rake, putting uh, dirt around a house or raking out the high spots and low spots in, in gravel. Be willing to do any part of that excavation business that they ask you to do so that you learn every part of the excavation business. If you if you think that you don't want to run a shovel or you don't want to run a rake, well, what are you going to do, really, when you get your own job, doing your own business, and you don't have that experience of knowing how to shape an area around a tile or shape, an, shape the dirt around a house or a sidewalk or whatever. That's the main thing, is getting the experience and be willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done working for that person. So that's my advice if you're wanting to start a business for yourself. In summary, saying that if you have a, a reasonable amount of experience, then I wouldn't have any issues with you doing it. I would say go for it. There's plenty of work out there to do. Maybe when you're starting out, don't go buy a brand new cat skid steer and a brand new cat uh, forestry mulcher or um, some of these other brands, ASV or Fecon or, or whatever the case is there. Start out with some used equipment, but good used equipment. Don't buy junk because you'll spend more time working on it than you will making money with it. And start out doing jobs. I started out doing uh, land clear, just small land clearing jobs with a uh, diamond or uh, a blue diamond brush cutter, 72 inch extreme duty brush cutter. That's how I started out, clearing small portions of land under brush. Then I kind of graduated into clearing uh, larger uh, trees and pushing it up into burn piles. And then I started uh, building a few pads and moving some dirt around and just kind of graduated, graduated up. And when I started off, you know, I wasn't charging $1,000 a day, $1,200, $1,500 a day because to be honest with you, I wasn't worth that much. Um, you know, I started out, there's some jobs I did for $70, $75 an hour just to get them, just to learn and start building a customer base. And charge your customers so that they're getting the best bang for their buck. And now then when I'm charging $1,000, $1,200, $1,500 a day, the customer is getting uh, a, a lot of work done during that day when I charge that kind of price. Not, not saying that, not bragging on myself that I'm capable of doing you know, a lot of work. It's just that I've got the experience now to know how to move dirt more efficiently. And, and as time gets up, goes on, I'll get even better at it. There's a lot of guys out there and, and gals too, girls too, that um, can run a dozer better than I can or run a skid steer or, or excavator better than I can. But the thing about that I take a lot of pride in is that I that I care and that I want to do the best job that I can for the people that I'm working for so that they get the, the, the best for their for the money that they're spending on those jobs so now that I spend a little bit of time kind of giving you an idea of how I do business and how I look at jobs we'll get a bit a little bit of windshield time going down the interstate here as we head to, to Red Bank and uh, when we get Next there, left. we'll kind of go over a little bit more in detail what this job's going to be about and what I'm looking at and why I'm looking at it uh, to get ready to do this job.
Okay, so we made it down here to the red, the uh, job site in Red Bank, and what we're gonna do is put in a driveway right here. So this is the job I'm bidding or pricing today. Is a driveway going right down by this telephone pole. Well, it's really a parking area. It's gonna go 30 feet inside there, and then the upper side's gonna be, it'll be 18 feet wide going into here. So what I was talking about on the logistics, logistics, easy for you to say, is getting rid of the dirt, getting rid of the concrete, for the sidewalk that we're going to tear out and getting rock back here so potentially we've got an opportunity to take this dirt from here and put it in the backyard a little bit of challenge we got to take down potentially take down some chain link fence get that chain link fence out of the way and then i'll be able to put it in the back and spread it out and not have to spend a good bit of time transporting this dirt away and then hopefully she's telling me about a place that sells rock and we'll go check that place out and see if uh, they can able to load a dump truck and they have the quantity we need to bring back to put the rock in here. So now that I've looked at the job, it's uh, it's gonna be a little bit tough getting equipment up here, some steep roads and, and some tight curves, but I think that's completely doable. And so those are just challenges that you look at to try to get your equipment here and then put boots on the ground to look at the job and see if, if they can work out, make you a list which I made a list of all things I need to bring. I need to bring a concrete saw, chainsaw, because we're going to take a tree out, and uh, uh, a drill and some drill bits because we're going to try to build a little bit of a reinforcement wall to hold the rock back. So all the little things, you need to make note of those things and make sure that you bring them with you and not forget them because that's uh, that just takes time away from the job. So that's basically it. That's the uh, description of the job and what we're going to do. Put all the materials together and probably do this job next week. So while I was driving down the road, you'll look at this job in Red Bank. Um, I got to thinking about a message and I was listening to movie radio and Mark Job was delivering a message about being accountable for sin. And I got to thinking about that. And while I was thinking about it, he actually uh, began to teach on this passage of scripture that was coming to my mind. And it was a passage of scripture in Genesis chapter three, I believe it's chapter three, uh, starting verse one. It's the account of Adam and Eve when um, when they sinned and mankind fell to the temptations of sin. So in that story, it'd probably take 30, 45 minutes, an hour to fully, really not even to fully, but to, to adequately cover all that's in this story and just, just to touch the surface of it, really. But anyway, what I wanna talk about is the fact that in order to be saved, in order to have forgiveness of our sins, and for the blood of Jesus Christ to cover our sins, we first have to recognize that we are sinners. We first have to recognize and be accountable for the sin that's in our life and realize that we need a savior. Realize that there has to be a price paid for our sins. And for a believer, that price was paid on the cross. When Jesus gave his life and shed his blood for my sins and yours, but this this accountability for sin problem goes all the way back into Genesis uh, in the Garden of Eden. We know that uh, knowing the story that uh, the serpent, Satan, had tempted Eve and to eat of the, 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 the fruit of God told him not to eat. And then she gave it to her husband, which was Adam, and Adam consumed this. And then the word tells us that they heard the Lord coming in the cool of day and they hid themselves this is interesting, hid themselves because they were naked uh, and they were afraid. So they heard the Lord coming and then the Lord said, he asked them, where are you? He said, Adam, where are you? Not because God didn't know where they were, but God was calling them into account for the sins so they would have to acknowledge that they were hiding themselves from God. So when Adam answered and he told God, he said, we hid ourselves because we were naked. I love what this says right here. Because up until this point, they had no awareness, sinful awareness of their nakedness. So God asked him, he, he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of this tree? So to try to condense this story into just a couple of minutes, um, Adam, God called Adam to account for his sin. And he asked Adam, he said, did you eat of this 
tree of the uh, the fruit that I told you not to eat. So Adam shifting blame here, not being accountable for his sin. He he said the woman, and didn't leave it at that. So initially he was blaming Eve for the sin, saying the woman you gave me. So then he shifted the blame from the woman. He actually shifted the blame for his sin onto God because he said but the woman that you gave me. So he wasn't taking account for his sin. And so then God asked Eve, he said, why is it you've done this thing? And then Eve says that the serpent had deceived her. So in this whole thing, you're starting from the beginning of mankind. We have been shifting blame for our sin to someone else, always blaming someone else for our sin and our failures and our shortcomings. And it's not until we realize and recognize that our sin is our sin and we need forgiveness of that sin can salvation take place so Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that at some point in your life at a point in my life I recognized that I was a sinner and in need of salvation and found that through the Lord Jesus Christ because of the finished work on the cross. When Jesus, right before Jesus died on the cross, he said these words, he said, it is finished. In saying that, the Bible says that he then gave up the ghost and then died. In saying that, Jesus said the, the penalty for sin had been paid and that there was redemption and forgiveness through his sacrifice that he made on the cross. I hope that, that these words are an encouragement to you. I hope that you are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're an unbeliever and you don't know this forgiveness, then uh, just read the Bible. Re read the book of John. It's a good place to start. And, and ask the Lord to help you understand. And then He will. And He will forgive you of your sins. If you call upon Him, He will do that. So God bless you and thank you for watching.